the stage. It's going to be like a saber-toothed tiger fighting a piece of paper. I'm going to shred your arguments like crazy. You want to know why? Because these doctrines that are now coming out as the genuine, bona fide, historical context of the Bible, like the Council of the Gods, the idea that God is married to a wife, and that they produce children, and Yahweh is one of his children, the head god of the god is how El... This is the El of the Bible, the Elohim of the Bible. We're talking the same God, even though he's taken from the Canaanitish pantheon. These ideas that the Bible's been rewritten and corrupted and changed, that the head God of the gods dwelt with a council of the gods, that it was a family affair, that it was an eternal family unit, and that they sired children, these ideas are rock. Solid. And I'm going to be more than happy to show you that. So if you think you're ready for the debate, here comes your first few videos. Now, Mark S. Smith, The Origins of Biblical Monotheism, Israel's Polytheistic, polytheistic Background in the Ugaritic Text. This is Oxford University Press for 2001. Mark S. Smith is one of the most solid biblical scholars on the planet, and his analysis of the archaeological discovered Ugaritic texts, along with the biblical background of Israel's original religion, is one of the most unique, original, astonishing discussions that I have ever run across. He's the one that talks about the pantheon of the gods is a family affair. He is the one that discusses the Council of the Gods, originally with El as the patriarchal deity, as the head god of the gods. He almost words it that way, with Yahweh as his son. In fact, he's one of the scholars that contends that El was the god of the Israelites who took them out of Egypt and across the Red Sea. It wasn't Yahweh, it was El, the Elohim of the Hebrew Bible. It's a very interesting analysis. He is the one that says that the writings of Isaiah chapters 40 through 55, the powerful monotheistic chapters in the book of Isaiah that declares you are Yahweh and there is no other God beside you and so on and so forth. His argument says that that was written after the exile. It was because the other nations, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and even later on in the Persians, as their empires became so powerful and they were able to destroy Israel's social autonomy. Israel was on the low end of the ladder. These other nations were on the high end of the ladder. That is when they started to emphasize the monotheism. But monotheism is not the opposite of polytheism. The two exist together, and I want to read that idea f to you from Mark S. Smith. Mark S. Smith, page 50 and 51, on this idea of the relation of monotheism with the divine counsel of the gods. A very fascinating idea. He says this on the bottom of page 50. He says, the divine assembly expresses at once the relatedness of the divine assembly to the world as well as to its transcendence. The relatedness and transcendence belong to an order in the cosmos ruled by divinity. It is the order itself that expresses a certain oneness of divinity. On page 51 he says, the divine council mediates the problem of the one and the many in the Ugaritic and Israelite language alike. This is what they were grappling with. This is the correct historical context of the divine council of the gods. 
as well as monotheism. They are not opposites. Mark S. Smith says this. He says, the divine assembly is not oppositional to monotheistic statements in biblical literature. The opening of 2nd Isaiah, Isaiah 40, itself involves a divine council scene. Now that's something I'll bet you didn't know, isn't it? This is one of the most powerful monotheistic chapters in all of Isaiah, in all of the biblical literature. But it's set in a divine council among all of the gods. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't know that, did you? Time to update yourself, isn't it? Monotheism requires that one divine assembly headed by one divine ruler but it makes little or no impact on the language of assembly in it of itself. The Israelite presentation of the divine council differs little structurally from the Babylonian presentation of Marduk in the Enuma Elish. Both Enuma Elish and the Hebrew Bible present a divine ruler surrounded by subservient divinities. These are not judges, they are gods. That's my saying, not Mark Smith. He says they are subservient divinities. He later on says they are gods when he analyzes Psalm 82 and says that the head god of the god decreed the lesser deities would die like mortal men. Monotheistic thrust in itself does not alter this general structure of the divine polity. He says, the imagery of the divine assembly represents for both monotheism and polytheism a pliable theological strategy for presenting order with the one and the many of divinity. There are both, not just either one or the other. This divine order may either mirror the conditions of the human world or it may oppose it. Assembly provides one avenue for expressing order and oneness in the conceptuality of divinity. That's crucial to understand. Of course, he says this on the bottom of page 52. He says, of course, there was a multitude of deities in Israelite polytheism with the sun, the moon, and the hosts of heaven included, in attendance, the divine assembly of Yahweh is quite full. And then he quotes, he, he mentions 1 Kings 22, 19. He says, compare Exodus 15 and 11. And then on page 53, the Israelite material manifest in the Bible shows far fewer, and what is left, at, that is, in the biblical material, is the council of a single God. Although the other gods are in this assembly, it is headed by a single ruler. And it is one attested, well attested form of Israelite polytheism. Divinity also involves oneness through relatedness, expressed not only in terms of power, but also in terms of care and in terms of love, as the concept of the family is prominent. And the family is the father god, the mother god, the son god, and the daughters. Their sons and daughters. This is the famous 70 sons of El from the Ugaritic uh, literature that he talks about. The case for the family model and its meaning in the Ugaritic literature, as well as some of the biblical texts, he also discusses. And he shows this family concept of the gods. I have at least 50 other sources that discuss this. Really, truly. The polytheism and how it was changed out of the Bible through textual criticism. Textual criticism has discovered this. I'll show you from Emmanuel Tov and Pete Kyle McCarter Jr. and E. Theodore Mullen Jr. And uh, I have some information on the Dead Sea Scrolls that I want to share with you. So these ideas of the biblical concept of the background 
Do these contradict Mormonism? Does this refute Mormonism? 